Today I am going to recite the first chapter of the Palace of Illusions. So, if you like my video, do not forget to subscribe to my channel and also do share this video with all your friends. So, let's get started. Chapter 1 Fire Through the long, lonely years of my childhood, when my father's palace seemed to tighten its grip around me until I couldn't breathe, I would go to my nurse and ask for a story. And though she knew many wondrous and edifying tales, the one I made her tell me over and over was the story of my birth. I think I liked it so much because it made me feel so special. And in those days, there was little else in my life that did. Perhaps Daima realized this. Perhaps that was why she agreed to my demands, even though we both knew I should be using my time more gainfully, in ways more befitting the daughter of King Drupad, ruler of Panchar, one of the richest kingdoms in the continent of Bharat. The story inspired me to take my fancy names for myself, offspring of Venginans or the unexpected one. But Daima puffed out her cheeks at my tendency to drama, calling me the girl who wasn't invited. Who knows, perhaps she was more accurate than I. This winter afternoon, sitting cross-legged in the meager sunlight that managed to find its way through my slit off a window, she said, when your brother stepped out of the sacrificial fire onto the cold stone slabs of the palace hall, all the assembly cried out in amazement. She was shelling peas. I watched her fleshing fingers with envy, wishing she would let me help. But Daima had very specific ideas about activities that were appropriate for princesses. An eye blink later, she continued, when you emerged from the fire, our jaws dropped. It was so quiet that you could have heard a housefly fart. I reminded her that flies do not perform that particular bodily function. She smiled her squint-eyed, cunning smile. Child, the things you don't know would fill the milky ocean where Vishnu sleeps and spill over its edges. I considered being offended, but I wanted to hear the story, so I held my tongue. And after a moment, she picked up the tale again. We'd been praying for the 30 days, from sun up to sundown. All of us, your father, the hundred priests he'd invited to Kampilya to perform the fire ceremony, headed by the shifty eyed pair, Yaja and Upyaja, the queens, the ministers, and of course, the servants. We'd been fasting too. Not that we were given a choice. Just one meal, each evening, of flattened rice soaked in milk. King Drupad wouldn't eat even that. He only drank water carried up from the holy Ganga, so that the gods would feel obligated to answer his prayers. What did he look like? He was thin as the point of a sword, and hard like it too. You could count every bone on him. His eyes sunk deep into their sockets, glittered like black pearls. He could barely hold up his head, but of course he wouldn't remove that monstrosity of a crown that no one has ever seen him without. Not even with his wife's, I've heard, not even in bed. Daima had a good eye for detail. Father was even now much the same, though age, the belief that he was finally close to getting what he'd wanted for so long had softened his impatience. Some people, she continued, thought he was going to die, but I had no such fears. Anyone who wanted to revenge as badly as your royal father that wouldn't go of body and breath so easily. She chewed ruminatively on a handful of peas. Finally, I prompted her. It was the thirtieth day, and I, for the one, was heartily thankful. Milk and rice, husk is all very well for priests and widows, 
but give me fish curry and green chilies and tamarind pickle any day besides my throat was scrapped raw from gabbling all those unpronounceable sanskrit words and my buttocks i swear they were flat as chapatis from sitting on that freezing stone floor but i was scared too and stealing a glance here and there i saw i was in the only one what if the fire ceremony didn't work the way the scriptures had claimed it would would king drupad put us all to death claiming we hadn't played hard enough once i'd have laughed if someone had suggested our king might do that but things had changed since the day when drona appeared at court i wanted to ask about drona but i knew what she'd say impatient as mustard seed spotting in oil that's what you are even though you're old enough to be married off any day now each story will come in its time so when your royal father stood up and poured that last pot of ghee into the flames we all held our breath i prayed harder than i'd ever done in my life though it wasn't for your brother i was praying not exactly kallu who was cook's apprentice then had been courting me and i didn't want to die before i'd experienced the joys of having a man in my bed but now that we've been married for 7 years here dai ma paused to snort at the folly of her younger self if she got into the subject of kallu i wouldn't hear the rest of the story today then the smoke rose i interjected with experienced dexterity she allowed herself to be pulled back into the tail yes and a spiraling nasty smelling black smoke it was with voices in it the voices said here is the son you ask for he'll bring you the vengeance you desire but it'll break your life in two i don't care about that your father said give him to me and then your brother stepped from the fire i sat up straight to listen better i love this part of story what did it look like he was a true prince that one his eyebrows was noble his face shone like gold even his clothes were golden he stood tall and unafraid though he couldn't have been more than 5 years old but his eyes troubled me they were soft they were too soft i said to myself how can this boy avenge king drupad how can he kill a fearsome warrior like drona i worried about my brother too though in a different way he would succeed in completing the task he was born for i had no doubt of that he did everything with such meticulous care but what would it do to him i didn't want to think of it i said and then time a made a face can't wait till you appear huh madam full of yourself then she relented even before we'd finished cheering and clapping even before your father had a chance to greet your brother you appeared you were as dark as he was fair as nasty as he was calm coughing from the smoke tripping over the hem of your sari grabbing for his hands and almost sending him tumbling too but we didn't fall no somehow you managed to hold each other up and then the voices came again they said behold we give you this girl a gift beyond what you'd ask for take good care of her for she will change the course of history change the course of history did they really say that daima shrugged that's what the priest claimed who can tell for sure you know how it sounds boom and echo in that hall the king looked stalled but then he picked the two of you up holding you close to his chest for the first time in years i saw him smile he said to your brother i name you drishtadyumna he said to you i name you draupadi and then we had the best feast this kingdom has ever seen as daima counted out the feast foods on her fingers smacking her lips in happy remembrance my attention veered to the meaning of the names her father chose drishtyumna 
destroyer of enemies draupadi daughter of drupad these name fell with the bonds of acceptability so if i were his parent i might have picked a more cheerful appellation like celestial victor or light of the universe but daughter of drupad granted he hadn't been expecting me but wouldn't my father have come up with something a little less egoistic something more suited a girl who was supposed to change history i answered to draupadi for the moment because i had no choice but in long run it would not do i needed a more heroic name nights after daima had retired to her quarters i lay on my high hard bed with its massive posts and watched the oil lamp fling flickery shadows against the pocked stone of the walls i thought of the prophecy then with yearning and fear i wanted it to be true but did i have the makings of a heroine courage perseverance and unbending will and shut up as i was inside the mausoleum of a palace how would history even find me but most of all i thought of something that daima didn't know something that ate at me like the rust corroding the bars of my window what really happened when i stepped from the fire if there were voices as daima claimed prophesizing my life in a goblet roar they hadn't come yet the orange lake of flames fell away the air was suddenly cold the ancient hall smelled of incense and under it an older war sweat and hearted a gaunt glittering man walked toward my brother and me as we stood hand in hand he held out his arms but for my brother alone it was only my brother he meant to raise up to show to his people only my brother that he wanted three wouldn't let go of me however nor i of him we clung together so stubbornly that my father was forced to pick us both up together i didn't forget that hesitation even though in the years that followed king drupad was careful to fulfill his fatherly duty and provide me with everything he believed a princess should have sometimes when i pressed him he even allowed me privilege he kept from his other daughters in his own harsh and obsessive way he was generous maybe even intelligent but i couldn't have forgive him that initial rejection perhaps that was why as i grew from a girl into a young woman i didn't trust him completely i turned the resentment i couldn't express toward my father onto his palace I hated the thick gray slabs of the wall, more suited to a fortress than a king's residence, that surrounded our quarters, their top bristling with sentries. I hated the narrow windows, the mean dimly lit corridors, the uneven floors that were always damp, the massive severe furniture from generations ago that was sized more for giants than men. I hated most of all that grounds had neither trees nor flowers. King Drupad believed that the former to be a hazard to the security, obscuring the vision of the sentries. The latter he saw no use for, and what my father did not find useful, he removed from his life. Staring down from my rooms at the bare compound stretching below, I'd feel dejection settle on my shoulders. like a shawl of iron when i had my own palace i promised to myself it would be totally different i closed my eyes and imagined a right of color and sound birds singing in mango and custard apple orchards butterflies flitting among jasmines and in the midst of it but i could not imagine yet the shape that my future home would take would it be elegant as crystal solidly precious like a jewel stud goblet delicate and intricate like gold flickery i only knew that it would mirror my deepest pain there i would finally be at home 
my ears in my father's house would have been unbearable had i not had my brother i never forget the feel of his hand clutching mine his refusal to abandon me perhaps he and i would have been close even otherwise segregated as we were in the palace wing our father had set aside for us whether from caring or fear i was never sure but that first loyalty made us inseparable we shared our fears of the future with each other she led each other with fire's protectiveness from a world that regarded us as not quite normal and comforted each other in our loneliness we never spoke of what each one meant to the other three was uncomfortable with effusiveness but sometimes i wrote him letters in my head looping the words into extravagant metaphors i love you three until great brahma draws the universe back into himself as a spider does its web i didn't know then how sorely that love would be tested or how much it would cost both of us